Hemp and cannabis, or why some may call Mary Jane, is a buzzword in Mzanzi's agri-space, and this week we explore the possibilities for new farmers to produce this niche crop. At Food for Mzanzi, we're inundated with letters from crop farmers who need help with plant health matters. So, we made a plan. AEC Plant Health joins us to discuss early blight in potatoes, a major disease that is often underestimated in South Africa. In our Agripreneur 101 segment, we meet Lungelo Mgaha, founder of Lakshan Fruit Beverages, a juice producer from Orange Farm in Gauteng. Our book of the week is Deep Work, Rules for Focus Success in a Distracted World by Cal Newport. And our farmer tip of the week comes from Uzer Isak, fruit exporter and managing director of RIPE, a Western Cape-based fresh produce exporter. This is Farmer's Inside Track, supported by Food for Mzansi. Inspiration for your business and life. From South Africa's farmers and agripreneurs. Hey, I'm Zanzi, and welcome to episode 121 of Farmer's Inside Track. I'm your host, Dawn Numdu. Let's get straight into it with that promised guide to hemp and cannabis production. Nicole Ludolf chats to Kwena Mohotla, researcher at the Agricultural Research Council. Thank you so much, Dawn. Now, Kwena, can you tell us a bit about yourself, please? How did you get into hemp farming? I grew up in uh, Limpopo, Polokwane to be specific, and I moved to Free State when I went to do my tertiary qualifications. And I'm currently having a, a degree in agriculture. I majored in crop production. I started working at the ARC in 2004. I'm the person who is leading the hemp uh, research. Can you tell us a bit about the hemp farming process? What is the life cycle of a hemp plant? Hemp is a type of uh, cannabis sativa that contains a low amount of THC, 0.3 to be exact. And maybe one may ask, what is uh, THC? THC is the main psychoactive compound that is found in cannabis. Basically, that's what makes people high when they smoke. So it is very, very low on hemp. When it comes to the life cycle, Maybe to start under the good conditions when planting hemp. I think it takes about three to five days to germinate. And then from planting until harvesting, it takes anything between 90 and 120 days. But that will depend on the type of cultivar that one is using. When I say between 90 and 120 days, I only talk about hemp for fiber production. But when you cultivate for seed production, then it's going to be a little bit more, maybe even about between 120 and 150 days. You harvest hemp earlier when you cultivate for fiber production, a little bit later when you cultivate for seed production. The way you cultivate them is different. When you cultivate for fiber production, you cultivate the plants so that they're closer to each other, maybe at about five centimeters between the plants so that they grow taller. But when you're cultivating for the seed, you want the plants to be bushy, so the distance between one plant to another is a little bit different. It can be anything between even 30 centimeter to about half a meter. So the difference in it is that when cultivating for fiber, you need the plants to grow taller and closer to each other. But when you grow for seed production, the plants need to be a little bit bushy so that they give you more buzz where the seed will be carried. Like any other crop, hemp also does require the major nutrients like the nitrogen, the phosphorus, the potassium, as well as the minor nutrients. You will need those kind of fertilizers if you want to get the maximum yields. The ARC has also developed production guidelines in collaboration with the Department of Agriculture in the Eastern Cape, which was developed, I think, in 2005-2006. And it mentioned all those type of things. For anybody who wants to actually farm with him to be the president's call for the industrialization of him, they would have to be people who have a lot of money because they'd have to be importing the seed, you know, and meet all of the other criteria as well. Am I correct in saying that? Not a lot of money per se, but of course, the prices are going to be different. It was going to be a much cheaper buying seed in South Africa without paying all those import permit and all those uh, costs that one will have to pay, comparing to what the person would have gotten when the seed is available in the country. 
So it is going to cost a little bit more compared to where if you're going to buy the seed locally. Between planting and harvest can take between 90 to 120 days, depending on cultivar. Are there many hemp cultivars in our country or many hemp cultivars to choose from? One of the things that we did at ARC is that we managed to develop two cultivars. We call them SA Hemp 1 and SA Hemp 2. Unfortunately, these two cultivars are not registered yet because of their legislation issues. Maybe just to give you a reason why this legislation issue that I'm mentioning, hemp was not uh, listed as an agricultural crop. Because of that reason, it was not possible to register any hemp cultivars. Hemp is cannabis, and cannabis is listed under the Drug and Drugs Trafficking Act. So those two legislations needed to be amended for these cultivars to be registered. The first process of declaring hemp as a crop was done by the Minister of Agriculture. So now hemp is listed as an agricultural crop, but it is still listed under Drug and Drugs Trafficking Act. Because of those reasons, these two cultivars are not registered. We are in the process of registering those uh, cultivars, but it's been almost four or five years since we have been waiting. So there are no available cultivars in South Africa except these two, even though these two are not registered yet. Because of these reasons, farmers are not able to get hold of this seed. So for anyone, if you want to cultivate hemp, they have no choice but to import seed from other countries. Is hemp production very expensive? Does it require a lot of infrastructure? I'm going to give you an example. One of the conditions when you apply for the permit to cultivate hemp is that the area where you're going to cultivate it, it needs to be fenced off. That's money. If you want to process the hemp, you also need some equipment. That is also doesn't come cheap. When you start, of course, it's going to cost you a little bit more. But going forward, the costs are going to reduce because you're not going to spend like the money that you've spent when you start the farming. Are there any specific pests or diseases that hemp farmers need to look out for? When we did our research, there were few pests that were picked up because the area where hemp was cultivated is not that much. So we found those pests to be insignificant. But I think that might be a problem when a large area in the whole of South Africa is cultivating hemp, that we might run into those type of pests. The main ones that are affecting the hemp that we have seen in the past are the American bullworm and the aphids and then the spider mines. Those are the three main pests that we have seen to be a problematic when it comes to production. Like I'm saying, even though what we have seen was not that much and we considered it insignificant, but if the area where hemp is going to be increased, I think the number of pens will also increase. That man also need to have farmers to have some sort of treatment to those to, to those type of pests. When it comes to diseases, now we haven't experienced any like much when it comes to disease, but there are diseases that affect hemp in the areas where hemp is produced. But in South Africa, we haven't experienced like any type of disease that we must say this will be a problem so when it comes to hemp production. Thanks, Nicole, and great having you, Gwena Mohotla, researcher at the Agricultural Research Council. Now for that promised discussion on early blight in potatoes. We are joined by Dr. Andre Siliers, the marketing manager for AECI Plant Health. Andre, thanks for joining us and also for answering some of the pressing questions sent in by our readers. I must say, I never realized that early blight in potatoes was such a common disease. Yeah, early blight in potatoes is probably one of the most common diseases that there is. It's been known to plant pathologists since the late 1800s. It's been in South Africa since about 1950. Most cultivars are susceptible to early blight, and it's caused by the fungus of the Naria solani. At some point in the growing season of any tomato plant, there will be alternaria damage of some sort. It's always there, and on every potato harvest or every year, you will get alternaria. The best thing to do is to control it carefully from the beginning to limit your yield losses due to the disease, and that's the best way to go about it. Okay, now that we know what early blight in potatoes is, what are the symptoms that farmers should look out for? The symptoms of early blight are usually seen on the older leaves. You won't see it easily on the new growth, the softer new leaves. 
You'll see it more on the older leaves. And the symptoms to look out for are what we call a concentric rings. To describe it to you, it looks like an old stove plate, such as circular rings of brown damaged tissue on the leaves. And usually it manifests halfway or so through the growing season. Slowly these lesions or these brown marks become bigger and eventually you find that the entire leaf collapses. When one looks at the lesions on the leaf, if you look at the perimeter of the lesion, if it's still yellow, that means it's an active growing lesion. In other words, the fungus is still alive and it's still actively growing on the leaf and of course the lesion is getting bigger and bigger and bigger all the time. If however the entire lesion is brown, then you know that the fungus has been controlled and the disease has been controlled and basically you've stopped the process of infection on the leaf. Now I'm guessing by the time you discover early blight in potatoes, it's actually already too late. Do you have some tips on managing it effectively? It's not necessarily too late, but of course a preventative strategy is a more effective strategy than trying to solve the problem once it's manifested already. The best strategy is to manage the disease effectively from the beginning. The way one does that is to try to reduce physical damage on leaves. This can happen in a variety of ways. You find insect damage. Now, every time an insect, a leaf miner for instance, every time a leaf miner actually feeds on the leaf or penetrates the leaf, that is an infection site that's been created there. And that infection site opens the door for fungal infection by alternaria or early blight. Before the leaf miner actually lays an egg on the leaf, they can actually make 20 damaged spots on the leaf before the actual egg is laid. So insect control goes hand in hand with early blight control. That's very important. The other thing, of course, is damage due to wind. What that basically means is that soil particles or dust that are blown by the wind can also cause physical damage to the leaf, which also gives you an infection site. So the whole aim is basically to reduce physical damage. Now, it's not always possible. It isn't possible to control wind, but if you do get wind with dust and you know that there's been physical damage, that's the point where you know it's now time to control immediately. The infection is not far away. There's always alternaria everywhere. In every potato field all over, there will be alternaria. So you must know if you've got physical damage, you have to control. There's no doubt about that. The other thing one can do is to keep the plant as healthy as possible. And by that, we mean keeping energy levels up, keeping the plant's own resistance systems optimal and that makes the plant stronger to resist not only the insect infestations but also the, the fungal infestations that follow. Another way to control the disease or manage it is to plant good tubers. It's important that you use good seed stock. In the case of potatoes we speak of tubers. So use good seed stock. Try to go for more resistant varieties. There are a few of these. That's a very good start in managing the disease from the very beginning. Now, since most commercially acceptable potato cultivars are susceptible to early blight, perhaps chemical control could be the answer. Do you have any products you'd like to recommend? A chemical control does remain the best solution at this point to control the disease. As I said previously, one can also look at keeping the plant's health optimal. We have a product, ACI Plant Health, as a product called Alexin. Alexin controls salicylic acid. And if that is applied on a weekly basis, you keep the plant's natural defense mechanisms at the highest possible level. So that's a very good product to use on a weekly basis as well. The best product for early blight in our product range is Barrier. Barrier is translamina systemic, which means it moves through the leaf. It moves from the top surface of the leaf to the bottom surface of the leaf and you get disease control both on the top and on the bottom part of the leaf. That is the best product. You should spray it about four times throughout the season. You can consult the label of the product on the internet. You'll find it there on our website, aecih.com. That's Barrier. The other products which are sprayed on a weekly basis are your contact fungicides. We have Ventum, Chloroflow. Our own copper product is called Kung Fu. It's a copper hydroxide product and it's very safe to use on crops. It doesn't burn. So those are your weekly applications. Ventum, Chloroflow and copper. Kung Fu is our copper. So those are the products that ACI Plant Health has in our product range, which are extremely effective against alternaria, early blight. And those are what we propose that any grower uses because you will get alternaria. Thanks for joining us here on Farmers Inside Track. Dr. Andre Siliers, the marketing manager for AECI Plant Health. You can read more on this topic on www.foodformzanzi.co.za. Now in our Agripreneur 101 segment, we meet Lungelo Mkhaka, founder of Lakshan Fruit Beverages, a juice producer based in Orange Farm in Gauteng. 
Now, Lungelo, can you tell us a bit more about your business, Locks and Fruit Beverages? What do you love about it? We specialize in fruit juice, specialize in still water. We want to integrate a, another product like your yogurt, your milk. So currently now we are focusing on pushing, penetrating the market with a uh, and fruits. Now, before we let you go, do you have five tips or pieces of advice for aspiring agripreneurs who may want to follow in your footsteps? I make sure that uh, my business got a positive image to the public. I make sure I create two-way communication with um, our customers and clients. And I make sure that I make Lokshin Fruit to be appetizing to the general public. Thanks so much for joining us. Lungi Alumchaka, founder of Lokshin Fruit Beverages, a juice producer based in Orange Farm in Gauteng. Next up, our book of the week is Deep Work, Rules for Focused Success in a Distracted World by Cal Newport. So I define deep work to be when you're focusing without distraction on a cognitively demanding task. Deep work is becoming more valuable in our economy. So it's becoming one of the most valuable skills you can do in our economy at the same time that it's becoming more rare. So people more and more are losing their ability to actually do deep work. So that is a classic economic scarcity scenario. Something is becoming more valuable while it's becoming more rare. And the conclusion of that is, if you're one of the few to cultivate a deep work ability, you're going to thrive. People are not lazy. So it's not the case that most people just aren't working much. At the same time, they're doing less and less deep work and and getting worse at deep work. So what are they doing instead? So this is where we have this notion of what I call shallow work which are tasks that do not require distraction-free focus. They tend to be logistical in nature. They tend not to actually apply your hard-won skills or create a lot of new value in the world. This includes things such as doing email and meetings and sort of PowerPoint slides and social media optimization and tweaking your website. All of this type of things is shallow work. It's not that there's no value in shallow work, but it does not require distraction-free focus and it's not producing massive amounts of new value. So the, the reason why we're busier than we've ever been before, yet doing less and less deep work than ever before, is that we're spending more and more of our waking hours dedicated to these shallow work efforts. Agriculture is not just about farming. It's about caring. And that's an ideal worth preserving. When your family doesn't settle for anything less than magnificence, give them the best with Magnificent Maize Meal. On the field or in the classroom, Magnificent helps your family perform magnificently. Magnificent is a product of VKB Group. Visit vkb.co.za or like our Facebook page for more. VKB, for the love of the land. If you have any book suggestions, feel free to email us on info at foodformzanzi.co.za. Now, before we let you go, our tip of the week comes from Uzer Isak, fruit exporter and managing director of RIPE, a Western Cape-based fresh produce exporter. There's quite a few risk factors when exporting, and I'll talk specifically on the financial side. So firstly, let's look at the customer. If you don't have a strong customer and you exporting to them on terms, and with those terms, you don't have any protection like credit insurance, you could easily send your goods all the way across the world to them and they could not pay you. To fight a legal case all over the world is obviously quite a challenge. So that's one aspect of it. The second aspect comes onto the shipping. For example, on shipping, there could be many factors. The delays in ports, which could have delays on your shipment arriving in time, which can affect the price because of market and then also the quality. I had a mango container that left South Africa to Dubai recently. We asked for it to be shipped at 9 degrees. It ended up shipping at 18 degrees for the entire three-week journey to Dubai. We had a 95% loss on that container. It wasn't anyone's fault. It's just a risk with shipping. Luckily, you have insurance for that, which covers you. But again, I always say the way to make money in fruit exports is to not lose money. And when I say that, I know it sounds quite funny, but it's to mitigate your, your losses across the board, whether it's with the shipping, whether it's with your procurement, whether it's with your selling. If you can mitigate your losses all over, then you'll make money. If you haven't found a way to mitigate this, you are in trouble. And our farmer top of the week from Uzer Isak, fruit exporter and managing director of RIPE, a Western Cape based fresh fruit produce exporter. Now for daily inspirational stories about the farmers, and agriculturists we write about every day on Food Form Zanzi, go to www.foodformzanzi.co.za and you can follow us on all of our social media platforms that's Facebook, Instagram, YouTube and Twitter. 
And don't forget to check out our weekly sessions on Twitter Spaces called Gather to Grow. Now remember, if you love this podcast, we love to hear from you. Please rate it and share it with your friends, family members and fellow farmers. Just give us some advice or tips or things that you think that we should be covering on this podcast. Now be sure to also check out our sister publication called foodforafrica.com for inspiration and news from across the continent. From me, Dawn Numdu, our producer, Megan van der Vendt, and the rest of the Food from Zanzi team have an absolutely amazing week. Bye for now. Life in South Africa can be a lot. I mean, scroll through Twitter for a minute and tell me I'm wrong. Thank God for South Africans though, right? We're inspiring and even on the bad days, we fight back with a smile. That's why I love Food Form Zanzi so much. They're not ashamed to celebrate the ordinary unsung heroes who work every day to put food on our nation's tables. Go to foodformzanzi.co.za and never miss an inspiring story.